It is March the 26th, I'm Chris, and this is The Future of Photography. The Future of Photography. And of course, there's Jeremiah with me. Hello. Back. Back. Well, I'm back, back too, California. everyone. If you are up here back in California. I'm back on the show. Adrian is somewhere drinking beer or something along those lines. That's it. Uh, we saw his beer pictures. He must have had more than one, I assume. I have no idea, but he's he's enjoying <laughs> the sunny the sunny weekend, and we're indoors. At least you have sunshine. I have sunshine. So. That's a good thing. That's it's a very good thing. It's a little gloomy today, but uh, oh, I'll okay. take it after after five months of rain. So yeah, I'm good. So uh, interesting topic you 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 thought up for this um, composition, past, present, and future, and this is one of the things where my 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 preparations for this topic. I was pretty much I only wrote down two words, then I added a bit more, but my notes say. Zeitgeist versus technology. Well, I you're you're hundred percent right because I, I I know cinematically when I work with different camera operators, um, I, you realize over the years that you cannot teach composition. You, you you can talk about it, you can have theory about it, uh, but finally, you cannot ask somebody to compose something instinctively uh, using a manual or a handbook. Yeah, they talk about Fibonacci and, cur you know, rule of thirds. We yeah. talk about all of that stuff. Uh, but still, if you know it, that doesn't mean that you have an eye for it. And and that, so uh, being able to compose, and, and I'm not arguing for one kind of composition over another as being more or less effective. I'm just saying that delivering one's intention in composition is something that really is instinctive or you channel the zeitgeist <laughs> to create it. It is instinct. I, I think I think we really have to look at these two different sides of it because the zeitgeist or slash fashion, whatever, is on vogue right now, what people... Uh, true. are used to that that is one uh, side of it and then the other is the technology and the different um well the different kind of cameras and other developments that it, that inform what compositions are easier to do and or sometimes they dictate the compositions i'm just thinking about like really early photography sure. we're looking at like yeah cameras on tripods long exposures that is a certain type of composition or lens itself sure. uh, yeah. and we yeah. cannot forget uh, the human condition and our odd obsession with symmetry though one oh, yeah. could argue symmetry doesn't really exist in in the universe so there's there's a competing form of our i mean we we tend to look at things that are beautiful through an analysis of symmetry you know what instinctively that that i i recently came across because that's that's one of those in air quotes truths that you learn that uh, symmetrical faces are more well more beautiful in general and you, you see that with certain people that are very symmetrical and some people that are not so symmetrical and um and i i just read a study just a Yesterday, two days ago, uh, I read about a study and I read the abstract where they came up with um, that symmetry is 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 something desirable, but it's just one hemisphere of the face, and it's usually the right hemisphere of the face as you look at it. <laughs> is that that is the is one that, true? that is the one when you mirror that it looks nicer than the left one, which I found <laughs> weird. I found really truly weird, but that is weird going to try and do that with myself take some selfies and flip one, double it and flip it and and one the, the left hemisphere again left from your from the from the watcher's perspective um as per that study which i don't think it, I, I, it doesn't really make that much sense to me but they say that the left hemisphere mirrored is gives you more of an un uncanny kind of uh, feeling. Well, that's strange. That, it's very that strange. Is, that, that, you know, 
It is. You know, when you talk about composition, I mean, there is what you talked about, the technical composition. Like we go from a square format, a four by three you know, format. Uh, the <clears throat> the original, the first uh, camera, well, the, the first commercialized camera, the Kodak, the first Kodak. Um, I saw that in the Eastman Museum in Rochester and uh, that camera shot round pictures. So oh, yeah. how does that inform composition? It certainly will in yeah. some respect. Yeah. Sure. Well, what one, you know, I, I've, you know, I've toyed around with circular compositions within compositions. Uh, and it's, um, again, uh, spherical yearns for symmetry, because it, it is symmetrical by definition. Have we, have, um, I have, think that, have we defined what composition is at all? Should we? I think it, we could try, it, it would be the art of placing things within a restricted frame in order to elicit a maximum response based on the intention of I think that that second I think that second part is uh, I, I would I, I buy the first part composition is placing things in a frame pretty much the second part well, yeah, to elicit the maximum there. response that is not necessarily true <laughs> for sometimes no it's sometimes true it right. does work and it's sometimes. not always the intention of someone that it mm. might be the intention might be very something very banal something very mundane as in like uh, placing things so from a scientific perspective so that they are adjacent to each other or something like that yeah sure comparisons and all the rest uh, you know i i think that um we also, you know, I, I don't want to get kind of in the weeds of what it means to place things in a frame because yeah. often you just go and look at a subject, snap it, and they self-place in the frame. <laughs> True. <if you> just <laughs> generally have them there. Well, they, and then you well, look they tend at it to be like, placed mm. in the middle of the frame because that's what you typically do when you point the camera at something. Yes. Uh, and and uh, so where they end up in the frame uh, which is a little different than if you're shooting in a studio on a tripod with, um, you know, with all kinds of control over light and placement, than if you're walking along the street and just see an event, a person, a moment, and try to capture it quickly. So both things will generate a composition. And when you look at the pictures afterwards, um, you'll, you'll go, oh, that's, that is a beautifully composed street picture. Which you may or may not have anything to have had anything to do with, because it could be purely accidental. Is is composition is that a conscious act that you do, or does is something that happened? Is that allowed to, to be called a composition? Because you didn't really compose it; you let it happen. Oh, you're talking about two different things. You're talking about uh, m making a composition or composition itself. Um, I mean, true, right now true. we're looking at uh, yeah. A screen, and in the screen there's another frame, and in that frame there's yet another frame, and in those frames there are circles and very true. You know what I mean? And <laughs> and, and non-symmetrical faces here. So, you know, I don't know where that leaves us, but but um, just you know, one could break down the limitations of what makes a composition into the borders of said compositions. In other words. Playing around with my Insta 360, you know, circular 360 cam. Well, spherical, I'm taking pictures yeah. Uh -huh. with, I, I really say, without composing. It's a very unnerving process, completely different to every kind of image capture that I've ever experienced. Because I, <laughs> I really, in many ways, I don't really know what no. I'm looking for. You know, that's interesting because because with with one of these spherical cameras that shoots a, a sphere, pretty much, um, you have pretty much only one one uh, one area of control, and that is how close you put it to something, and then that informs how big item X is in relation to all the other items in the in the well frame is not the right word in the sphere. And uh, but but then of course what you do is if you want to then adapt that later on into a format for a screen for a, then then you compose it later so so the uh, what you do is depending on how you will use it is that you that you delay the act of composing to a later point in time. That's true, but the capture moment is not really 
a composition. No, it's not driven no. act. No. You know, and I'm not quite sure what does trigger my instinct to push the shutter mm -hmm. on the street. Generally, I'm just learning about it, so it's uh, it's an exploration. Um, you know, I come up through limitations of frame. That's my go to. And, and so, you and you're right. I have a uh, one of the first uh, generations of the Ricoh Theta, which is the, the same thing. It's a spherical same. camera, and uh, and uh, yeah. the 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 process of well composing, which is not composing, um, <laughs> and taking the picture, finding that decisive moment to trigger the shutter is it it, it for me it lacks a certain amount of of, of satisfaction it's weird I, it's I couldn't i i agree with you now could we be talking about this really in many ways being the future of composition and we've talked about this before with um you know, uh, cameras on the street, multiples of them, you know. Um, or little drones hovering and everywhere and, and capturing exactly. stuff. Exactly. Yeah, and, yeah. and when they're 8, 10, 12K and one is able to stitch them all together for a continual view of, you know, coupled with satellites of the entire planet in sharp detail, um, and one could have access to that, uh, or one has access to one's 360, then the act of photography may just be one of capture. And then here's a question that is, or could be controversial. Is AI uh, a possible solution to composition with enough input of what constitutes minimalism, how you define rule of thirds, Fibonacci, all of those kinds of things, randomness, center punch, symmetry. In other words, can one reduce that to code, input that with enough um, examples, throw in a 360 degree spherical image and say, please uh, computer, could you generate me the most beautiful <laughs> image? Uh, <laughs> Right, find, based on these parameters, find find images that that uh, that adhere to our adhere to certain attention. parameters. Yes, mm, huh. that's it. I think I mean that that should be possible as long as you can clearly define certain styles or right. or or have enough annotated uh, examples to feed uh, to feed the algorithm to to train it, but then. It's not going to create anything new. It's just going to it's it's search it's a it's a pattern matching operation uh, of sorts well, at that point. Maybe it maybe it won't create something new, but maybe it will. In other words, like those paintings that are created by AI after inputting, you know, a thousand portraits, a thousand techniques, a thousand different uh, color spaces, and a thousand different kind of old masters. And they generate something completely bizarre, which is often uh, a work in in and of itself. And often you have the code writers taking credit for that. Here's a here's a thought experiment. Uh, I have um, I just recently read about um, someone using GPT three, which is a text based AI that you, that is very very advanced, and you can ask it uh, to do certain things yeah. and it will output certain things and uh, yeah. someone someone said that he uses gpt3 um as a copywriter like his personal copywriter his email writer or email answerer his um oh and so on and so on so so what 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 he did is he used his own stuff that he produced over the years as input into GPT-3. So he used his own scripts mm -hmm. and fed them to GPT-3 and uh, has a GPT-3 persona that is the ego uh, script writer. So whenever he needs an idea or something, he just tells that persona, um, give me three paragraphs of a, of a short script of, uh, uh, about this and that. Like you need a good prompt and then it will come up with something based on you. And the same is with emails. He, he fed a lot of uh, emails and like like prompts and prompts and re replies into that thing and created an email persona. So now um, it, it's not the end all, 
but it's the it's a it's it's a starting point. It uses yeah. uses Sadly, that as a starting no point. More fr- Sadly, he has no friends left. The, and the or- originality <laughs> probably suffers. But, but uh, just imagine you have a sphere of something. You 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 think that there might be some really awesome compositions in there, and now you tell that AI, uh, find me some very Jeremiah compositions from this sphere, and it spits out three or four that it, in air quotes, thinks might be uh stuff that but then of course i'm i'm looking at i'm i'm looking at your body of work and uh pretty it hard is, to it do is that. so varied there is no <laughs> jeremiah style there is several jeremiahs I, in there you know i exp- i explore multiple avenues of yes, you do. the same thing basically that that's really it <laughs> falsity in truth i don't know but it, um, it, but in general the the technology will always inform composition uh the cameras again they were they were very static in the beginning and then they became smaller and that enabled them to be moved around and they they got so small that uh like reportage photography was suddenly possible street photography became possible uh candid photography became easier i mean just imagine ouija uh, with this Graflex um, trying candid photography, not as easy, but if you have a Leica, that will change the kind of photos that you can get. And if you have an iPhone, an iPhone right now that is so ubiquitous, you have like no no one will bat an eye if you if you point it straight at them because they're everywhere. Because everyone does it, it it doesn't necessarily mean even that you're taking that picture. And the you're reading your. Twitter and the cameras become smaller. I mean, we talked about these grain of salt size cameras, but uh, even even yeah. without that kind of uh, dystopian angle, uh, there are small cameras that you can just clip clip to your uh, to your t shirt, and they will just capture in pretty decent resolution stuff all the time. That no one no one will notice that that's a camera, or people will just ignore it. So, um, well, here, the, here's a question, Chris: What makes a good composition i i asked this question to my students <laughs> what makes a good photo and a good composition and it's in the end it's the one that moves me in one way or another it's the one that evokes any form of emotion for me yeah so i mean i i can look at a photograph that's infinitely layered cluttered busy um, and, and almost psychedelic in its, in its kind of lack of a cohesive, symmetrical, or rules based, right. and go, wow, that is amazing. And yet I can look at a snowscape with a single tree and maybe a human as a dot, you know, short-sighted on a very, very wide shot, and go, wow, that is so evocative and beautiful. Both elicit strong psychological responses and emotional responses but we don't uh, respond analytically i don't but, think but but how much of these responses have been conditioned in us because i am I'm, I'm looking at for example what i did i did a okay i i i lied i did a little bit of prep by going to our <laughs> kitchen and taking yeah. a couple of cookbooks out of the shelf and mm-hmm. i took one from the, the early 70s and one from now, and one from somewhere in the middle, because we have a good collection of cookbooks. And the, the we do too. <laughs> and in the seventies, if if you if you look at those, there is photography in these cookbooks that is not necessarily um, dictated by the technology, but by the zeitgeist, but by what people liked to see in the style at this time. And if you look at the older stuff, there's like almost like opulent. F- overfilled still lives of things with additional stuff fruit and stuff thrown in and uh, and now and and then in between it seems to have become a bit more minimalist like almost like a japanese garden zen kind of uh, fashion fashion and, and it's fashion and nowadays um nowadays more people who are not professional photographers get into that field. So you get a, a bit of a mix up of things again. But interestingly enough, um, 
pretty good stuff. Also, people have more more people have access to to the tech to do it in a, in a good way, and of course, they also have a lot of access to YouTube and other places where you where you learn a lot, and that breeds a new generation of uh, of photographers with their own. Um, with their own likes and dislikes, and so, but it 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 has changed dramatically over the years, and some of it is some it, of it is tech informed. If you look at the colors in these well, old I, photos, the film did something I, else than digital does. Yeah, yeah. I th I think you're right, and I think that um, composition is culturally applied. I I think that that's true. I'm not sure how it is, uh, but I'm I'm pretty sure it's done. And uh, my own example of an evolution of my own compositional, I don't know, appreciation is, um, you know, I, I would say I've come of age in the era compositionally of 235 format, 166 format, 172. In other words, that's the That's the, 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 the Hollywood aspect ratios. Right. Rectangular compositions. When I and, and that's how I came of age. When I became a fashion photographer, I became enamored with Hasselblad six by six square format, which in many ways is the most difficult to compose effectively, um, but is the most satisfying for, for me. I just a, a great square image is just so powerful, and I'm not. I'm, again, I'm not sure why that is. But recently, the, I guess because of the iPhone, when I first got my iPhone, started to take more pictures, I, I just always had to use it horizontally. But over the years, with the 169 or the 916 composition, which has become ubiquitous, right? Thanks to, thanks to our smartphones, yeah. That's right. I've grown culturally to appreciate the kind of tall and narrow compositional frame, and I'm using it more and more. Part of it was the exploration even of NFT and how those tend to get um, exhibited shall we say, um, and, and because screens offer the limitation, both on the iPhone and display in the 16 by 9 world. And so that's ch it, it literally changed my appreciation of a format and in myself or self-encouraged to explore more compositional elements. And that's a complete technical cultural application of what we were talking about right and, i know, remember it's a change, so i remember the first time so, i was asked to to shoot something in uh, 9 by 16 upright and uh, it was for some a boutique and they had a 16 by 9 tv on its side so to, to yeah. just some just some 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 nice moving pictures on that and no, nothing was prepared for that the t entire technology workflow chain didn't exist so you had to use a camera you had to tilt it to the side and and then in the editing you had to edit it on its side and export it and then oh, yeah. rotate it it was really really uh, didn't didn't feel didn't feel too natural. right <laughs> it didn't feel natural at all but it's 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 what we're used to i guess yeah well, now my screen can tilt any which way. <laughs> so, Sorry. how not that I do. But. So, so how how is the future of composition going to look like? I think we're going to see as um, technology um, evolves in terms of giving us the limitations of screens, both in terms of viewing and the limitations of capture we are going to be exploring uh, those limitations through traditional and non-traditional composition. Uh, but if you look back at composition, because I, you know, my, my instinct of, of just exploring what is composition harkens back 
to painters um, or, or even before, um, you know, the cave paintings that we see, which are on rocks and often multidimensional and, and are framed somewhat by the limitation of the space right. that they're in and how, how much fire could have lit them at any one time. So there was a natural kind of order to where you wanted to um, make your work, even, you know, 20, 30, 40,000 years ago. So the same kind of instinct was there. But as we got into hieroglyphics, there was a natural order of compositional lateralism, you know, uh, which expanded. Uh, when you get into uh, mosaics, the limitations of architecture created a tremendous amount of compositional authority. Um, and then later to canvas and all of that. But those compositions were very um, fluid. In other words, you could stretch a canvas, tiny, huge, small, wide, square. And when one looks at the history of art and painting, you know, from... Not even talking really the, the Middle Ages would not be a great example because the limitations were then generally maybe more architectural based because of church and that kind of things. But, but you know, even, even then, the size of the canvas, which would have to do with the materials available and how many of your, um, if you had a studio, um, how many of your workers could prepare these things for the master. Um, but I always wondered, like, you know, if you look, you think of like a painter like Titian or, or, or you know, would he say, I, you know, I want something that is, you know, six hands high by huh. 13 horse lengths and, <laughs> you know, I want it prepared that way in this exact way. Or... Did his guys come in with a big piece and go, we found this, you can use that. I mean, these are things that you don't really read about in the history of art. Like, what really determined the size, scale, scope? I'm not talking about commissions, which were generally architecturally informed, but I'm just talking about expressive compositions right. for these painters. And if anybody's listening, please send us an email or join our Discord and tell us because we want to know. Yeah, I think my my thoughts about the future are not along the not along the zeitgeist because I have no idea what fashion is going to be like in ten years from now. I I cannot predict that. I mean, fashion maybe people who make fashion will predict that because they make it, but um, I'm not part of that group. Um, so I can only speculate from a tech side, and that is, I think we will have more and more restrictions lifted from us. And I'm not sure if that's going to be so good for creativity. But you know, the cameras are getting smaller, getting more ubiquitous. You can throw a hand. Soon you can throw a handful of cameras onto something, or stick cameras into places where you couldn't before. I mean, just think of a cookbook, and you have a have a camera that swims in the in the soup. Or something like that. I don't know. I mean, you will you will have less restrictions. So the act of composing is, and uh, the act of composing for that reason will become will be part of the later stages of the process, not the earlier ones, as it is when you compose while you shoot. So I think well, yeah, I think that has that has its very strong implications. But don't you think the iPhone is already on its way there because you could use your phone to shoot in a square format, in a wide format, in a yeah, panoramic but you could, format? You could always a, crop, you know, that's 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 not new. Yeah, I think No, what, you could crop but I'm talking about the capture moment, not not the post Yeah, okay. Not the second thought of it, but the going out with a square to look at the world through a square, you will take very different Oh yes, very true. Very photographs. True. Then, if you go out thinking I'm going to do a series of panoramas, same same landscape or same people or whatever. I think I think we'll, we'll your limitations. I, I think we'll close the circle by thinking about the circle where the first Kodak camera shot in a circular <laughs> format. You can now get uh, Polaroids that are circular, so they have a mask and they, you shoot a circle. So how about that? 
Yeah, I don't think those caught on. Why not? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> Why are we in circles here on the video version of this podcast? I don't know. I don't, we can make badges out of them. I, uh, but, but, you know, I, I often think about has composition truly evolved? Probably not. When you look at the history of, yeah. of art, all of the, whether it's a long and na you know narrow and and tall portrait of some royal from you know 1620 whether it's a massive gursky type landscape of a battle uh painterly whether it's persian miniatures that are small and precious um and you just evolve that through the photographic process the daguerreotype you know uh, which is you know was based on the size of the metal that you were able to use really um some bigger than others but not massive um i think that we will get rid of more compositional um limitations because of the 360 and our laziness and ai and the ubiquity and be able to like basically to unclip our camera from the day and go Hmm, what did I see today? Maybe I can make some pictures out of the history of my 24 hours or something. That that may be possible. And of course, we're assuming great quality throughout. Or when I say great quality, I mean the quality that we want, whatever that is. We'll become hoarders. Um, we're, we're going to be capturers and not uh, consumers anymore. We just take pictures. Possible. <laughs> yeah, But, you know, um, and, and then some of us will make pictures from what we've t taken. But but I think the future of camera design, I always wonder when you're thinking way out of the box, not like beyond AI or lens efficiencies or pixel densities, those kinds of things. If you're thinking of what is the the most limitless of capture mechanisms if I had to build one from scratch with no limitations, but tap, all the technology in Tap the world. into your optical nerve. How about that? Like, what, what would it be? What would it, what would it feel like? <laughs> um, you know? Um, it, it, it's worth thinking about as we pick up our camera and be conscious of the limitation of our frame, which is, I think, why this kind of discussion about moving the definition of composition, which is inherent to every single picture we take, make, appreciate, yep. display, we often don't think about it. We just respond to it or we go, ah, but when composition is there, uh, it really, I think it really is the limitations of what is outside the frame and not what is inside the frame, what you leave out of your image is as very, important as what you put in. Very well said. So, I guess we'll move on to the pics. I'm, I have, I have come, <laughs> I have come up with one. I know you don't. You didn't have one so far. So I'll, I'll give you two minutes to find one. At the, in the meantime, sure, I, I am going to, um, to right. talk about one of my favorite cameras. Um, and a very recent composition. Uh, Jeremiah, do you, do you know, or, or you, you certainly have experienced the, the, the magic that, m that can be in test shots. Like you, oh. you, you take pictures and you have these posing pictures and you have these, these now it counts kind of pictures, but then in between you take yeah, a test sure. shot of a gray card or, uh, or, yeah. or some, I don't know, corner of a curtain or something. And they, those sometimes yeah. end up to be the magical ones. Um, because, yeah. cause, cause there was yeah. no pressure. There was no, you didn't really compose anything. It just happened. And that, yeah. uh, so, so here's a test shot that I just, um, that just came down from the stars and it is James Webb telescope oh, I test saw shot. This. I, so, I love this. So oh, what, yes. what we're looking Great at is test shot. they have finally for, for one of the instruments, they have aligned the mirrors earlier than I thought. And I think earlier than they thought. And, uh, they, they, they pointed the telescope there, there, mm, oh God, what is it called? The, mm, near cam the near infrared camera the one instrument out of the three they have on board and they pointed that at a very insignificant star somewhere far out and uh, used it to test the sharpness of the system and 
it comes back. This is an engineering picture. This is not a science picture. This is just to see if the camera works. But luckily, they published that because you get you get a couple of things here. First of all, you get uh, the star, and it's sharp, and it has this diffraction pattern that was predicted. That 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 is pretty much comes from how how the camera is uh, is constructed. But then you see like a hundred or more galaxies in the background that have never been seen before by anything not Hubble not anything else because that thing is capable of looking out into the into infinity pretty much and uh, especially time wise back billions of years and uh, there's galaxies out there that yeah this is this is new stuff this, this is, is it's just it's just a test this shot, is you know? definitely <laughs> my favorite camera it's it's world. wild. It's this wild. Is my absolutely favorite camera. So I can't. And this is sorry. Go ahead. What what amazed when what amazed me about this, and they were very kind of clear about it. Oh yeah, yeah. We finally focused on that star that we thought, and in another six months, we'll be able to take our first picture. Right. And this is okay. This is just a very yeah. early, early taste of a little star that is yeah. now famous, but no one really knows its it, name. <laughs> in in every one of those little galaxies, remember those are galaxies. Yes, thousands, with billions of, of stars in them. I mean, every it's just... one of them. Yes, so it boggles the mind and it makes us um, feel as insignificant as we should. It's akin to the Hubble uh, deep field pictures where they pointed it at some empty. Black. seemingly empty space yeah, and, out there and it came and back after a billion after days of exposure it came back filled with galaxies and they can now do this yeah. anywhere and and it turns out that wherever they point the telescope it will come back with a, a whole bunch of galaxies and stuff this stuff yeah, is everywhere and and we could we could say that uh, everything in this picture doesn't exist anymore so well, do we know do we know uh, it's it's well, definitely the different. It's definitely different now. Yeah. But maybe yeah. they're still I mean, if, if they think, yeah, they still think the universe is about 13, 14 <laughs> billion years old. Let's, let's figure out over the next couple of years if we might have to revise that number. Here is your pick. It is something Speaking of composition. Flexible. You know, a thinking of something that is compositionally um, flexible, both in terms of wraparound and or size. Um, it, it, it's, it's pretty amazing. And the quality... It's a display. It's a display and it's dazzling. Um, you know, you, this is the kind of thing you could... You will see in forms, architecture, design... Um, as it becomes less expensive, uh, you're going to start to see this really influence all manner of advertising magazines. I mean, imagine a thin magazine that has an active video display on in the page. So the, these are, at this point, these are the kind of displays that you would see in a folding smartphone kind of thing, or maybe... No, a, the, or are they, are they on, are, on buildings and are, are they bigger? Are we talking yeah. about... Yeah, they're... They're bigger, yeah. They're they're for, you know, a lobby of an apartment building, you know, oh, or I see. fancy ass. So you, you can know, wrap them around huge. a pole or uh, adhere them to the shape of a wall or of a, I don't know, yeah. a sphere or whatever you want to do with it. Awesome. Yeah, they're 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 quite amazing. I mean, they're only a millimeter thick. So just think of that. <laughs> you know, that's um, that's the dream I had when I was 16, that one day we would have monitors that would roll up and we could just put somewhere mm -hmm. without taking up any space. And if yeah. you needed it, you would just pull it out like a, like an old scroll with stuff written on it. Yeah. But it's a display. Yeah. And here you go. There it is. It's right there. Only took 30 years. Yeah, wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Probably more more like several thousand years. <laughs> Very but true. Anyway, yeah. <sighs> so, yeah, let's keep thinking about composition because it is something cultural. It is something yes. technical. It is something aesthetic. It's learned, but it's worth thinking about. It's amazing. 
composition in the past, in the present, and in the future. Um, if you want to get into contact with us, you can of course do so at uh, on our Twitter account, TFOP Now, or on our Discord, which is linked in the show notes. That's a great place to have discussions, show off photos, and yeah, just just get philosophic about these kind of things and maybe even get something tangible out of it. So uh, we'll be back soon again, hopefully with Adrian again. And uh, until then, everyone, take care, get in contact and uh, tell others that we're here. We'll be back soon. Bye for now. Bye all. You've been listening to The Future of Photography. Subscribe to the show wherever you get your other podcasts. Find the show notes and more information at thefutureofphotography.com. Thank you.